everybody. Uh, this is uh, Paul Neeson with uh, Fruitful Trees, and we're here with uh, Julian Laurel from Laurel Farms, and uh, we're going to have a great time uh, tonight taking questions. Uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us. If you are joining us after the live chat, you can put your question below the video. But I wanted to have uh, him on because he knows a lot about uh, fruit trees and grafting. And many of the questions I get under my videos, uh, people are asking me, and I thought he'd be a great person to answer many of these questions. So please post your questions if you have questions uh, for him tonight. And uh, tell us a little about uh, your farm and yourself and your history, Julian. Um, well, hi, thanks for having me, Paul. I really appreciate the opportunity. I think uh, this will be a pretty interesting uh, experience doing a, a live chat uh, Q&A about exotic tropical fruit and fruit trees with uh, all of our friends on the internet all around the world. Uh, I am from Miami, Florida. I have a tropical fruit nursery here, and uh, which my dad started in 1980. And, uh, and around that time, I was about you know, eight years old. And um, growing up with him taught me all about the wonderful world of tropical fruit. And uh, just you know, grow up, grew up eating lychees and star apples, and star fruit, and my main mango, you name it. You we bring it home all the time. So, uh, you know, started working with him in the '80s and the late '80s, and uh, finally took the business seriously back in '97. And uh, you know, and, and you know, the rest is history. My dad unfortunately passed away back in uh, August of this year. And, you know, he's very missed, but he's definitely left a, a big impression on, on me and, uh, and a lot of other people. And we pride ourselves in providing, you know, the best, you know, the best mango, the best mame, the best um, canisto, you know, whatever it is that um, that's hard to find. I try to make it accessible and uh, and reasonable for, for everybody. So, and um, I, you know, I'm very, uh, very careful and always try to, uh, to uh, learn more things every day because propagation and <clears throat> grafting these things is a complicated, uh, complicated thing. And uh, it's very uh, rewarding at the same time because uh, you get to see the actual fruits of your labor. Sure. Well, uh, we've been to your farm uh, several times doing videos and we look forward to doing more. People love them. So keep up the great work. And uh, I mean, I'm just addicted to your farm and your trees and everything else there. So, uh, so, well, but it, a, yeah. it's a little, it's a, it's a, the small nursery compared to all my neighbors, which are ornamental nursery. We're talking about, you know, hundreds of acres, you know, if, if not just that a hundred acres, it's just humongous. So, you know, we're a small, we're a small nursery. We're about 10 acres. And, uh, you know, I try to cram in as much stuff as possible. And it's an amazing thing because uh, you have such diversity in the, in the small amount of, of land that it, uh, it's really cool. One, how, how many acres is your farm? Tell everybody. About, about 10 acres. 10 acres. Not including um, the house. Okay. You know, I don't have to commute. I just wake up and you know, I'm not working. So everyone that's watching, please post your questions that you have. I got uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, what's been the biggest challenge recently uh, that you're working on right now trying to figure out there? Uh, one of my biggest challenges right now I'm trying to figure out. Well, first I see Snills and Garnet says, sorry to hear about your father's classroom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, well, believe it or not, uh, I was gifted some durian seeds from uh, some Musang king fruit that was uh, that was for sale. It was some leftover fruit, and um, he uh, gave me the leftover fruit, 
planted the seeds, they all sprouted, they're beautiful. And I want to graft them. I want to get these things grafted. So I'm just, you know, learning about durian here. And uh, I contacted uh, somebody in Hawaii that was kind enough to mail me some budwood from his uh, durian collection in Hawaii. So he, brought, he sent me about three different varieties. I grafted them all, probably about three or four um, scions of each variety. And out of everything, they, you know, only one made it. And uh, because of a lot of reasons, you know, I, I discovered that they get the same fungus growth that Spanish lime gets. Um, it's like a white beard that grows on the, the, the scion and on the cut. So I've, I'm using a, a, a remedy for that with the Spanish lime. And I didn't know I had to use it for the during. So next time I get budwood, I will definitely apply that, um, that remedy so it doesn't get the white bearded fungus. Uh, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty terrible because uh, it kills every single one of them. And you got to be careful with durian and uh, overwatering. Even if you have, you know, a good medium, they don't like a lot of water. They can they can uh, get root rot and die very easily, uh, especially when they're young, like the one I have. So out of all of them that I grafted, I got probably just one to take it. So I have I've officially I have officially grafted a durian in South Florida. I've gotten. Uh, what did you graft it onto? A seedling from a durian seed? Right. The, the seedling, the seeds that uh, uh, of some leftover fruit a friend gifted me. So I still have those seedlings and I do sell them on my website, um, larafarmsmammy.com. But it's too, uh, it's too uh, not warm enough to grow durian durians here for the most part, right? Well, um, it's, let me tell you, it's a task. It, it, it wouldn't be easy. Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. If you have um, the will, there's a way. They don't like too much sun. They don't like uh, too much shade. They don't like it too hot. They don't like it too cold. They like it in the Goldilocks zone. And, uh, and then the dirt, they, they're into sandy black dirt or, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work and the facilities you would need for that, you know, will be pretty, you know, pretty costly to say the least. Okay. Um, but, you know, I just, my, my plan is just to keep it in a container and, you know, in and out, I just have it in the greenhouse, bring it outside, put it, you know, somewhere shady, put it back inside. If it gets cold, and just, you know, go like that. Great, great. All right, another question is, and we're getting questions, everybody, please keep the questions coming. So uh, we're going to answer them. So another question is, when you, uh, I know you say you have a small place, but 10 acres isn't that small, but a lot of us that are watching have like one acre. So what can we honestly get away with in terms of distance? We plant trees from, let's say, mangoes and avocados or kimito. What's, what can we get away with if we're willing to do the work and prune the trees? Well, you can fit 90 trees in one acre. I have about 80, <laughs> but what, but what, uh, but, but like when they start growing bigger, do you just got to keep pruning them? Is that the trick? Yeah. You got to prune them and maybe even cut some down that are in between you know, sooner or later. Someone's some, some of them are going to have to go because when the other ones get too big after 10 years of pruning, they're still going to take up the room. They're going to grow sideways and you're going to have to cut them, you know, cut their, their shoulders off. But how so, much distance do you recommend? I mean, if somebody I has... recommend 20 feet because the more sunlight, the more flowers, the more flowers, the more fruit. So if uh, one side of the tree is shaded, it's going to you know, lose that portion of the tree as far as uh, making fruit. It's always the side that the sun's hitting that makes fruit. So if you have it all around, you're going to have fruit all around. But if you're, um, you know, making a high density growth, 
you can do that as you know in for a long time but at the end there's going to be a it's going to come to the point unless you do some really severe cutting cutting back it's going to come to a point where you know you're going to have to start at zero again or get rid of one that's in the middle so you can let more sunlight i'm getting to that point i'm i mean my my growth is so dense i'm thinking about cutting down a brewster lychee that's you know humongous it's always going to be humongous no matter how much i cut it back just like so we get some sunlight in where the my maze are it's sure, a, sure. A lot of real estate it's a lot of real estate okay so uh how many trees do you have on your property oh i don't know i'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go on google earth and uh -huh. start like that's funny okay so we got a question here uh besides trees uh, julian also sells fruit from his trees uh, and so somebody's asking, do you have Kamito for sale? Um, I had it on my website. They're trickling down. I had, um, I sell five pounds for 45 bucks on my website, uh, uh, LaraFarmsMiami.com. I had about 10 pounds available for sale today and uh, I posted it on my website and they're gone very short after. Um, there's... You know, they're beginning to ripen right now. So as they come in, I'm going to be um, posting them. So as that, you know, comes in and it's going to be more, it's going to be heavier and heavier as time goes on. Probably by the end of this month, it's going to be more heavy. So you'll see it on the website more consistently. But right now they're just starting. So they're just trickling in and sooner or later it's going to get heavy. And it's going to last all the way to June. And in March, we're going to have the white ones. That's when the white ones start. Yeah, somebody was asking next, is that what varieties of Kamito do you have? Um, I have my house variety, which is the very low latex variety. i also going to have some Lara plums, which is the smaller one. The, my house variety is uh, the size of a baseball. And then the white one that comes in um, March, that one is about the size of a softball to a baseball. It's very big. Yes. Uh, I'm getting a house variety when I come down. It was so good. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, so uh, somebody, uh, um, just another question is, is there a waiting list for like when the food comes in? Like, could you have a waiting list that people want to order? Right. No, I don't, I don't like doing waiting lists. It's, um, I, I, I got to figure that out. I have to make some kind of, uh, a setup on my website about pre-orders and stuff. But um problem with pre-orders, you know, you're happy to take all these orders, but if you come short with fruit, you know, that's a you know very unpleasant situation that I would rather avoid. So I like to really just present it as they come and where it gets it first, unfortunately, is you know gets it. Okay. Right now, until another, I figure this out. Yeah. Another question is uh, how many varieties of mangoes do you have? Um, I have at least a hundred in the ground, maybe more. I'm top working, I'm cutting down trees and top working with new ones, with new cultivars. I'm even top working plants that I have in 25 gallons that I'm not excited about anymore. So I cut that and uh, when they sprout, I just graft some new varieties that are up and coming and cool. Um, okay. But as far as I also have more, I have a lot of trees, I have about 30 trees and containers that I need to put in the ground. So if you add those up, it'll be like 130. So what's your, the top three mangoes you have in your opinion? And also what are the three, like you regret re putting in that you're getting rid of? Okay. Um, regret, I'm getting rid of. Um, well, I'm getting rid of, they're good mangoes, nothing to regret, but it's just no one cares about it. Something that I regret, I really, I don't know. I mean, I haven't really chose a bad one to my collection. I just, I just get rid of them because no one's excited about them. And there's other stuff that are really exciting. Like one of my favorite mangoes is the Gary mango. And I have yet to, to try new varieties that you know are really popular. I haven't tried Pineapple Pleasure. I haven't tried uh, Ugly Betty. I haven't tried Lemon Zest yet. 
But the Gary mango, I like. I like the sugar loaf because it tastes like Gary to me. That makes sense. And it tastes like um, like a tangerine orange and mango mixed together. And it's a very unique flavor. I really love it. And uh, Alampur Beneshan is another mango that I love. But it gets a lot of disease in my area. If you're closer to the ocean, you're going to have less disease pollen, probably not any at all. So if you have a, a space for mango, berry, or Alampur Beneshan, those are my two favorites. I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm forgetting. There's a whole bunch of mangoes out there that are phenomenal. Maha Chinook's a good one, a, a lemon meringue. Those were the type of mangoes I like. But if you want a classic flavor mango, none of these fancy um, unique flavor mangoes. If you want something classic, like classic mango flavor, like Indian mango. My favorite mango, classic flavor, flavor mango is Ott, O-T-T. -T. It's from California, San Diego, I think. Very, very far south. Let me tell you, you want to talk about classic flavor, you want to talk about spicy. I, I used to call it, I used to refer to it as the improved Hayden. But that was like my dad's favorite. He turned me on to that. And I've been a fan ever since. I really look forward every year to try that mango. We had one in front of our house. And then in 2005, um, some hurricane knocked it down. I forgot the name. It was rolling. And then we planted another one. It's been growing and getting bigger ever since. But the old one was huge and it made a lot of food. When a tree's knocked down from a hurricane, I know mango roots, like you can move trees pretty well. Can you just pick it up if it's not too big? Yeah, yeah. Mangoes are very resilient, apparently. Mangoes and, and custard apples, they can be practically with no roots whatsoever. You put it back in the ground, it's going to sprout again and grow. Okay. It's going to be roots. Very Tell resilient. Everybody. Tell everybody about the trick you told me, what you do with the hurricanes. I remember when I first came to you, you told me. Tell everybody about that. This is a good tip for everyone. Yeah, like if you have, you know, an old tree and, you know, a hurricane's coming, you know, to prevent that tree from getting uprooted, what I, and, and you don't want to prune it too much or you just don't have time to clean it up and it's going to lay around. What you do, what I do is I get a chainsaw and I look for the thickest, most vertical branch and I get my chainsaw and I cut right into it halfway through. So what will happen, you know, as low as possible, as, as you know, if, if the branch is like this thick, you know, it, try to cut as low as you can and leave all the laterals and leave all the, um, the side growing, everything else, just one of the thickest branches that go straight up, just cut it halfway with the chainsaw and then during the hurricane, if the hurricane's strong enough, it'll finish the job of the chainsaw and snap that thick branch instead of uprooting the whole tree. And if the hurricane is not strong enough, you can build, and it stays, then the plant will heal and it'll continue growing. And then you can cut it back later if you want to. Now you're talking about super big trees. You're not talking about smaller trees, right? Right. Well, even for a small tree, if you know there's a hurricane coming, it's a good idea because these smaller trees will uproot too. Not as bad as an old tree. You could probably stand it back up and, and just hold it up with something. Okay. Okay. So do you recommend people that have, I mean, trees that are maybe 10 feet tall or whatever, if a hurricane's coming to cut all their trees a little or not necessarily? Like yeah, just, I, would, I would do I would do the whole grove. And it doesn't take that much time. That's another that's another good thing because if you have an entire grove that you don't that you know the hurricane's coming, and you don't have time to prune it, and um, you know you don't have a lot of time, you can just get a chainsaw and a ladder and just look for the thickest branch and cut it. Because that thick branch is, it works like a sail on a sailboat, and it's going to push the whole tree and the whole tree is going to fall down and all the roots are going to be all exposed. And if you stand it up again, you might lose all the roots on this side. So to prevent all that, you just cut the fattest trunk out of the five, let's say there's five, you cut the fattest one. And that provides, that just takes away so much weight and it will prevent the tree from falling down and uprooting. So that's the whole purpose behind it. 
Okay. Uh, so another question is, uh, will you offer multiple grafted mangoes in the future? Um, cocktail. Cocktail mango. Um, it's possible. It's possible. I mean, I'm getting, I'm ha having a hard time, you know, keeping a steady inventory of just single grafted mango. I want to talk about multi-grafted you know, it's, you know, it's possible with, you know, in the coming years. I like doing stuff like that. It's fun. By special request, would you do that or not necessarily? You're too busy. Uh, yeah, special request. I mean, it's, it won't be cheap, but you can come over and we can, we can talk about what, what mangoes, you know, should you choose and all stuff. And we'll, we can do a cocktail. What I'll do is just get a 15, a 15 gallon tree. And just graft, you know, three or four mangoes on top of there. Wait till they sprout up. And when they sprout, the customer can come pick it up. What's better, multiple grafted cocktail mango tree with different varieties grafted or like two trees in one hole? What do you think would be better? Uh, the two trees in one hole trick is pretty good because I don't, for some reason it provides a lot of drainage. Uh, I guess because the hole so massive. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm a single tree kind of guy. I guess I'm kind of, you know, old fashioned. Okay. So somebody's asking, uh, and we, he can't answer this now. We don't have time, but is, they're asking what varieties of mangoes do you have? No, no. Of mangoes, go to his website. He has all of those, but they're asking what varieties of my maid do you carry? Um, okay. Well, I sold out of my maid. First of all, I want to do a disclaimer, uh, right after the pandemic. People just started going out with their families looking for something to do, I guess, and just decided to buy trees for their house. So I've sold out on my name. And uh, good news is it's up and coming. Um, I grafted a little bit of every single variety that I have here at the nursery. And uh, if my memory serves me correct, I'll start naming off the, the varieties. Okay, so we got uh, Key West, which everybody knows. Got Magaña, which is uh, the big one that's five pounds that everybody sees in the supermarket. That one's from El Salvador, from the Magaña farm, the Magaña family. Okay, so that's two. And we got Pace, which is the our house variety, one, the one my dad made. It's a hybrid between the Tazumal, which is uh, um, previously known as Prolific. That was the name of it for a long time. For like, that was the name of the cultivar. And they changed it to Tazamal just to honor, just pay homage to all the um, Mayan cities where they're native to, they're native to the Yucatan. Um, so Pace is a hybrid between Tazumal and Magaña. So that's number three. And then number four will be Tazumal. We have Tazumal. Tazumal makes fruit in December and January when there's no season. But the problem with that with the problem with the Tazamal is that it doesn't have even ripening. It's hard on one side and perfectly ripe on the other. And on the perfectly ripe side, let me tell you, it's like eating a green sapote. It's the texture, the taste, everything is just phenomenal. It's phenomenal, phenomenal. And that quality is present in the pace, which is one of the reasons why pace is my, one of my favorite my mates. Okay, so we got Tazamol. The next one would be Florida. Florida is, uh, you know, an old school mummy from the 70s from the research center my dad used to work at, uh, TREC, the Tropical Research Education Center uh, from the University of Florida. And it's very dense, very sweet, um, you know, like a nice, uh, nice texture. It's not, it doesn't break down. It's one of those textures like, you know, uh, Key West, you cut it in half, you put it in the refrigerator, it kind of turns into jello. This one is more pasty, just like the paste. And paste is named after my, my, my parents. My dad decided to name it paste because the first two letters of his first name, which is Pablo, and then the first two letters of my mother's name, Saris, C-E. So P-A-C-E is paste. So that's what the origin is of the name paste. So we got Florida, so that's five. And with the, another one is Lorito, which means, um, you know, parrot, or, you know, talking parrot. It was named after um, a guy that everybody called Lorito because he would talk a lot. 
And we got Cepeda, especial. And by the way, Lorio is considered to be <coughs> one of the best manes. And personally, I, I think it is one of the best. I mean, it's a definitely alternative to uh, Key West. Better than Key West, and it's more red than Key West. It's very, very red. Key West has a tendency to be um, kind of orange in colors sometimes when red. It still tastes good, but aesthetically and, and optically, you know, just you know, just looking at it, it's very attractive. It's just very attractive to see that red, red mummy. Another one is Cepeda Especial. <coughs> That's number seven. That was a a, a, a mame from the Yucatan. It's also, let me tell you, it's very similar to Lorito. And, and uh, another one similar to Lorito, that's from Yucatan, is Aquil, A-K-I-L, Especial. That's another one from Yucatan. Excellent. Um, and then there's Vidal Redondo. Phenomenal. Deep red. These, these are like deep red mummies, these ones that I just mentioned last. Um, okay, let me see what else. There's uh, the Viejo, Viejo uh, cultivar. So that's that would be 10 so far in that uh, I mean, Everybody knows Viejo, I think. It's a very, very peculiar mame. It's uh, It makes small fruit, like a green sapote. The flesh is like so red, it's like almost purple. And the, and the flesh is very, very tasty, very tasty, very peculiar. I mean. And it's a local one from this area. Um, it's uh, this old man uh, that my dad knew. He uh, brought some seeds from Costa Rica <coughs> um, of this, of this mame. And uh, it, it, whatever, it took 10 years to fruit. And it was so peculiar, so weird, that uh, he was known for that mame, that old man. And uh, everybody referred to it as El Mame del Viejo. So that's where it got the name, is the old man's mame. So that's why it's called Viejo. So, okay, so that's uh, that's Viejo. What else do I got? Um, I got one called K40 that Richard Campbell gave to me like 20 years ago. I've yet to taste that one. Um, I have another one called Pozo Azul. That means blue well, like a wishing well. Uh, Pozo Azul. And those make tiny mames with, uh, uh, like Viejo, with, you know, very skin, um, skin similar to uh, Key West. Um, there's more out there. I just can't remember right now. Lobo. I have yet to try that one. I have one in the brown. And uh, gosh, if anyone, if another one pops into my head, I'll, I'll be sure to uh, scream it out. Oh, I do, I am planting a pumpkin pie. Pumpkin pie, my man. That's a brand new one. Uh, I, I just, I got uh, my second one. So I'm gonna put it in the ground. It's a very cool mame because it's dwarf. Hello, there's no dwarf. The only thing that's remotely close to being dwarf, it would be a viejo. And then after that would be Madanya, because Madanya, unlike other mummies that go straight up looking for the sunlight in the rainforest, that's the thing, whoever gets their first wins, this guy grows short and wide. So, all right. My, my, my list, that's my list. Yeah, and you mentioned Green Sapote <coughs> several times, and uh, I've tasted it recently, and wow. I mean, if you put a blindfold on me and, and gave it to me on a spoon, I would think it was a mame. It's literally a mame. It's uh, amazing. Amazing. So uh, yeah, he has green sapotes. Uh, I don't know if he has a fruit for sale now, but he has the trees for sale, right? Um, those are, those are um, being propagated now along with the mame. Hopefully okay. I have all these mames that I mentioned um, available on my website. For those interested in mummy and okay. green sapote, I have two varieties of green sapote. I have the Whitman, which is the the original variety, like the only variety known to a lot of research centers and collectors. And then most recently, the Pohamo, which is from Hawaii, that makes a larger fruit than the Whitman. Okay, okay. Well, uh, so next we have uh, somebody's asking. Uh, 
Uh, can you find breadfruit trees, cocoa trees, and coffee plants? Do you have either of those? I have cocoa trees. I have uh, chocolate cacao trees, seedlings. I do want to graph some of those. I do have a lot of seedlings I can graph. And I just planted some more seeds uh, just recently. Somebody gifted me some, some fruit. And um, what were the other two? Breadfruit and coffee plants. Okay, yeah, all that's in the work. I have, I have coffee plants. Uh, I've had coffee for many, many years, maybe like 20 years. I got some, uh, some Arabica seeds from the Fruit and Spice Park 20 years ago, planted them. And they've been making me coffee every single year until like 2016 when Irma blew through here and ripped off all my shade cloth. And I've been really slow in replacing the shade cloth. And the coffees haven't been happening. So they look, they're in rough shape. So I'm, I'm going to be ordering the shade cloth and uh, covering up those coffees. But they're still making fruit, even though they're in full sun. They're still making coffee. Me, I just got to plant all those seeds and uh, grow them up. <coughs> I got to, you know, just, you know, consider grafting coffee too, just to get the process going a little bit faster. But I, I noticed that you really don't have to unless you have a, a really good variety. But they make fruit like in three years, which will be about the same time it'll take a graft of the tree. So okay. those coffee, cacao, and breadfruit. Breadfruit, I'm air layering some breadfruit. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it's cold and uh, they take, you know, they like when it's hot, they root faster. So it's, you know, it's taking time. But I think I have to take a look at it, see what the roots look like. And then I got to plant it, put it out in a, in a container. Excuse me. And then when that's, you know, probably like by the summertime. Okay. I have several questions. Uh, or several people talk about Beverly Mango and somebody's saying, I heard Beverly uh, has a rot and uh, black spot issues. What's your experience with that? Um, bacterial black, uh, black spot. They said black spot, but I'm assuming bacterial black spot. Well, and th 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 let me tell you something about Beverly. You gotta live close to the to the ocean. You gotta live in, in, in a place where it's where it's breezy, where the where you, where you have low humidity. Because Beverly is a very good mango. It's a late season mango with, with red skin on it. It actually has red skin. It's very that's what's uh, cool about it. Um, but it's very susceptible to disease. It's very susceptible to drachms. And they get full of black spots. What can you do to prevent that? Spray it with copper every two weeks. Spray it with fungicide every two weeks. That's what you gotta do if you're getting black spots. If you live you know, considerably close to the beach or to a nice big lake, then, then you wouldn't be having this problem. But if you're living in a place that's inland, which you probably do, you're getting a lot of fungus. And, you know, Spraying with copper, and mangoes love copper. Okay, next question is somebody's asking, what is good soil for growing mangoes in pots? Good soil, uh, well, my soil mix is comprised of Canadian peat, cypress woods, cypress sawdust, sand, compost, and that's it. Um, I like for containers, uh, for the backyard, I would, uh, um, go to Home Depot and buy some pro mix with pro light and, uh, fill up your container with that. It has good drainage and has Canadian peat. Oh, and pro light obviously is one of the ingredients in my soil mix. And, uh, and it's in pro mix with Prolite that they sell at Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever. They, you know, it's almost, it looks very similar to my mix. Let me tell you, it's expensive. My, my load used to cost $2,800 for like a 50 yard load. And that, I got my bill the other day, $3,400. Wow. wow. Materials are scarce. Very, very scarce. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Tom from Sleepy Lizard, the avocado guy, he has a wonderful avocado place. He asked, he says, uh, would you say you eat more Kimito than you sell or sell more than you eat? 
Yeah, I, I know the avocado guy. He's, I, I did a video with him. Very nice guy. Um, well, let me tell you, I love kainito. That's one of my top three favorite uh, fruits. And I think it's one of the most underrated fruits. As a matter of fact, I got one here. I got two of them right here. Might eat them tonight. <laughs> All righty. I love them. I came down there and tasted several of your varieties. They were wonderful. And somebody's asking, can they stop by and get some? He already said that he's running low, but as in the future, near future, he'll have a lot for sale. Right. Uh, so just call him up if you're going to get down there to see what he has, if he has what you want. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, another question is... <coughs> A lot of questions coming in. Uh, a lot of people are having a discussion. Well, the difference between green uh, Whitman and Pohamo. Whitman is about this big, and Pohamo is probably about that big. There's some big green sapotis out there. I had no idea they got that big, but they, yeah. How big are the bigger ones you said? That. Like a great but, but smaller than a Mame, right? Well, yeah, they're, I mean, I have my maize. Like, for example, the viejo and the pozo azul, they're like small my maize. They're like jabota cava. They're growing the tree like they're jabota cava. It's, so, it's very cool. Yeah. That's the pozo azul. So let's see here. Uh, everyone's thanking you. So everybody spoke. Oh, somebody says, uh, do you ship to California? Yeah. Yeah, I shipped to California. Uh, I shipped to all 50 states. I don't know about Alaska, but I've sent it to Hawaii with success. Yeah, I see Johnny H is on here. I had, you know, a, an issue with UPS, man, that they uh, mishandled the package and all his trees got uh, cold damage, unfortunately. And uh, it was, let me tell you, it was a big order. It was $1,300, his order. And uh, I told Johnny not to uh, not to not to worry, and I refunded him because we, even though it's a loss for me, it's a bigger loss for him. And uh, I you know I really felt bad about that. I mean, UPS should be you know should be ashamed of themselves, but whatever, that's history. Sure, sure. Uh, so somebody's asking, what do you think about the laurel wilt disease on avocados? Um. Yeah. Uh, I just say if you get the laurel wilt on your avocado, cut it down, get rid of it, throw it away, don't leave any remnants of it, and plant an, another avocado tree. Don't be afraid. Okay. Uh, you mean cut it out completely, this yeah. whole tree? Yeah, cut it out the tree. Get, you okay. know, cut it to a stump and, and whatever, pour some gas on it. Yes. Uh, so... Speaking of avocados, how many? Uh, I know you got a ton of varieties and they're all for sale on your website. Uh, and uh, you got me addicted to avocados because uh, they're just so good. Uh, so what's your, your top three avocados that you love? And, and yeah. you told me you got rid of a bunch. Which ones did you that you didn't think were the best you got rid of? Um, well, let me tell you, I got uh, a friend in Puerto Rico that sent me this avocado. To try it was called Tito T I T O. I'm like, all right, let's try it. Man, talk about dense. It's the dense, it's the most dense, creamy, oily. It's like going like this. It's getting stuck all inside your mouth. It was unbelievable, man. I will never underestimate that guy again. And of course, I'm going to get butter with it. Yeah, I'm just going to say, I know you got butter with <laughs> Oh my gosh, I got another avocado. Come on, it better be good. And let me tell you, that shit blew me away. Excellent. So, another one on the chopping block. But I've always eaten Simmons my whole life. My dad loved Simmons. And then when I was younger, I wasn't into avocados. I don't know, but as I grew, let me tell you, for me, Simmons is the best. The, the best. And then I tried to run. Ronnie's a black avocado that uh, that comes late, you know, 
Simmons comes in the summer. This one is like in the winter, January, February, March, April. Uh, yeah, it hangs on the tree for a long time and makes a lot of fruit. And that flavor is just, it's just like, it's like the Tito, but Tito, Tito is like Ronnie, but like to an extreme, you know, Ronnie's just like perfect. You know, uh, I got 40 varieties of avocado, uh, more or less. And uh, I cut down a few that, you know, I'm, I'm really not excited about anymore, just like I did with mango and I'm top working new ones. Got uh, some pura pura vida. I don't know if you ever heard of pura vida. Well, that's that's one of those long necks, one of those long neck avocados. It's super long neck. I mean, I, we have long neck avocados already. We got the Russell, and we have our own uh, our own variety. I got my phone phone nuts. We got our own long neck variety, and uh, and the other one is the the Hardy. The Hardy is like the red red skin uh, long neck avocado. Some people call it the red Russell. Um, I got the Campong avocado, which was David Fairchild's avocado. Amazing. I tasted it. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, got, I got, uh, got that one. Um, <clears throat> I got the Taylor, which looks just like, hold on, I think I got one here. Taylor looks just like uh, a Haas. I think I have it outside. You know, I was down there recently, and he has so many avocados. They're just wonderful. Yeah, I think I think somebody took it. It looks just like it looks just like a Haas Taylor. Does it and taste it, just like a Haas? Yeah, yeah, it tastes perfectly fine. Um, you know, then I got our old purple skin variety, which is amazing. It's easy, easy peel. Oh, I found the seedless one. Seedless avocados like this shape, this big, looks like a pawpaw, and it's solid. There's nothing in there. There's no seed. It's just a solid. You can cut it and peel it like a banana, and just eat it, or just cut it into circles. And, it, and the flavor is great. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a great tasting avocado. So I top worked some of the ones that I cut cut down. So as soon as they get big enough, I'm going to be grafting those. And I did see that somewhere before. I think I saw it on a poster <clears throat> and they call it cocktail avocado. And I think it came from a tree that would do that sometimes, that would make seedless fruit. It would make seeded fruit and seedless fruit. But this tree, all of them were, were like that. And it was a tree here that was, somebody was growing locally at a farm. And then I recently found out that they cut the tree down. <laughs> Crazy. Wow. Well, I want to remind everybody, post your questions if you have questions uh, for Julian. Uh, we have a question here. Somebody says, do you think this year with this cold front hitting South Florida will be a good year for lychee fruit harvest? You know, I started seeing flowers on my sweetheart lychee. I saw some little flowers going up at the very tip, very tippy top of the tree. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, my, my trick, what I like to do on the coldest night of the year in January, get some Ziploc bags, depending on the size of the tree, it'll be the size of the bag, and fill it up with ice, throw it next to the trunk, and do it for like three nights in a row. And uh, that hopefully will be enough to shock your tree into flowering. Because if it's not cold enough, it won't flower. It will be like, you know what? I, I don't think conditions are very dangerous for us, you know, dangerous enough for us to feel that we have to leave an offspring. So it looks like we should take advantage and, and just focus on growing. Because it looks like the weather and the climate looks pretty good for growing. So let's grow. And if it's too cold, be like, hey, we might not see another, you know, mild winter. Let's make a lot of flowers because we might die. So we're better off leaving some offspring in case we die. So to help it make this decision, throw a bag of ice under, under the trunk. 
that's a little a little trick. You do it with um, with pomegranate up north uh, to shock them into, into flowering. But that's like the 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 wonderful pomegranate. All right. Uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, you know get those likes up so that more people will see the video if the likes are higher. So if you could just hit that like button. And also super chats open as well if you want to get your question while we have time first. So uh, another question is, is wind a problem for young jackfruit trees? Repeat the first part. Is wind a problem for young jackfruit trees? Oh, wind. Uh, I would say so. Tie a bamboo to it. Make it sturdy. Because uh, what happens is the wind goes like this to it back and forth, and then the roots are getting all, you know, getting, you know, stressed out and cut and broken. That's bad. Get a, a nice, strong bamboo and stake it on there. Okay, or a post, right? A post is good too, huh? A post? Yeah, the metal, the metal fence posts, the green ones. Yeah, well, your bamboo is about this skinny. So yeah. it goes in without disturbing the roots. I got you. Okay. Okay. Uh, somebody says, how is the flavor of highly red avocado? Uh, when is the fruit mature? I'm sorry. Say it again. How is the flavor of highly red avocado? And when oh, is the fruit mature? Oh, highly red avocado. Um, it's on the watery side. It tastes good. It has a nice nut, like walnut flavor, but it's on the watery side. It's a red skin avocado. Usually red skin avocados are, are on the watery side. But uh, yeah, this one I found in, in, uh, in Hialeah. It was uh, a seedling a neighbor planted in their front yard. And I look out my window and I see a red ball and the avocado. I'm like, is that an avocado? Red, round, avocado. Unbelievable. So got some budwood, brought it to the farm, had to have it. Hialeah red. It's not a hair color. <laughs> All right, another one is what is the most overrated and underrated tropical fruit, in your opinion? Um, overrated, well, underrated would be Kaimito and um, somewhat Sapote, like the Campbell. My God, I tried a uh, 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 white Sapote at Trek. And it just said, you know, a seedling, a seedling, and the name of the person who planted the seed. And it was uh, Richard Campbell's dad back in the, in the 70s. And I tried this fruit and I was just blown away by it. I was just it was about, not that big, about that big. I was just blown away by it. Oh my God. Uh, I'm going to be getting some more uh, budwood of that and grafting a lot of those. So hang tight. Another underrated uh, fruit, my God, this is one that's going to surprise everybody. I, I would just, I just loved it. I tried it before and it's one of those fruits that you've tried already and you're like, nah, I, I didn't like that. Wampy. Wampy. Really? Underrated. Underrated. Next to the Campbell tree, they have a wampy tree, a wampy ceiling and they were perfectly right. It was full of fruit and the perfectly ripe ones were just Heaven. It's like it's like eating white wine nonstop. It's just everyone was better and better and better and better and better. And better. It has this really weird taste to it. It's just I, the only thing I can compare it to is white wine. It's delicious. I was loving it, loving it, loving it. Wampy, underrated. Now overrated, overrated. Tommy Atkins. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Let me think. Let me think. Overrated. I don't know. I got I to gotta sit down and think about that one a little bit. Um, I don't know. Uh, blackberry jam fruit. Yeah. Do you have, uh, do you sell peanut butter fruit? No. No, I think that's a it? cool fruit. I think that's a, I think, yeah, I've had it before. I used to have a tree and my mom cut it down. It was too close to the pool. But um, yeah, that's a really cool fruit. It tastes just like peanut butter. 
amazing. Exactly. It's amazing. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody says, any tree stress is good for the trees to make them produce fruit. A baseball bat tree even, it works. <laughs> I don't know. That's just a comment. It wasn't a question. Okay, here's a question. Does uh, does Laura have, I mean, does Julian have, uh, they said, Laura, but Julian have any uh, ilamis? Uh, uh, no ilama. Uh, anonia. Yeah. No ilama. I used to, I used to, I, I bought some ilama trees from Brazil probably like 20 years ago. And uh, let me tell you, they're a lot of work. They're very fussy plants. Um, they don't, they didn't do very well for me. But on the other hand, they do well for other people. They have recently gotten into it. So um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really, I'm not really, I, I know it's a good fruit. I know it's a great fruit, but I don't know how, how easy it will be for the average customer to grow. Let me tell you, it, it gave me. It wouldn't. It wasn't. It, it wasn't pretty. It, it just didn't. Look, it didn't work out for me. I might have to start looking into it again because uh, there's a lot of varieties. I know it's a high price on um, plant right now. You can see them on the auctions and on eBay and whatnot. But I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm gonna have to um, explore llamas again. See what's up with that. Fruit pirates. And I don't know, I think we lost Paul, but I'll keep going. Um, fruit pirates? No, not for a long time. Uh, Sri Lankan weevil? No, I don't have any problem with the Sri Lankan weevil. Yeah, throwing the llamas is no. No easy task. Uh, brown prime man, mango did flower last year and it hasn't flowered this year too. And it's grafted. What could be going? What could be going wrong? Um, what could be going wrong? It's not flowering for you. Maybe it's uh, <clears throat> usually when that happens. Um, <clears throat> Usually, when that happens, um, the tree is healthy and it's focusing on growing instead of flowering. Um, maybe don't fertilize it ever again. Probably you best thing. Best advice I can give. Um, okay, can rambutan survive in South Florida? Uh, rambutan, not unless you have like a million dollar greenhouse. Yes, I will be selling green sapote trees in one gallon online. Hopefully soon, we're talking about a month, give or take, maybe two months. You know? And uh, that's it. I don't know if there's any more questions. Uh, purple mango on your website is named Can't Figure This Variety. Purple. Oh, it's probably the Casturi. <clears throat> oh, Casturi mango is a is a, a cousin of mango. It's a mango relative. Okay, M Casturi. The M is Mangifera. Mangifera Casturi, and mango is Mangifera indica. So that's the one. I, I think that's what you're talking about. Um, if one has room for one or two, one or three lychee, which would be the most reliable, tasty ones? Um, my favorite right now is Kaimana. That one's from Hawaii. Sweetheart and uh, Hakip. I tried the Jiki. That one tastes like a peach <clears throat> and a lychee mixed together. Just like no my chi. Um, <clears throat> see what else? Rambutan growing successful in South Florida might 
you fill it with commercial fertilizer. You fill it with, let me tell you, if Rambutel would grow in South Florida, everybody would be growing it. So I don't think. Uh, Julian, what is your worst year for tree loss due to cold weather? That would be when my dad, that was back in 89 and 81. Very cold. Everything was covered in ice. The fence, the trees, the leaves, everything was a disaster. Everything died to the stump, but everything grew back. Uh, yeah, it can be very healthy. Okay. Um, can I play the keyboard? Uh, it's out of uh, out of water right now. Uh, I don't fertilize anything at my food forest. Just the wood chips. Connecting. Oh, Paul, you're you're back. You can help me with the question. Yeah, don't put no more wood chips. Just uh, just uh, you know, you don't want anything. You don't want to give it too much nutrients anymore. Well, it says here Paul is connecting and can't hear you yet. Well, my microphone is on, I think. <coughs> so, let me see. Paul, can you hear me? Are you back? I think you have to turn on your mic. I think your mic is off. Your mic, your microphone. It's off. Can you hear me? Okay, now you got it. I got you now. All right, good, good. Well, I'm sorry about that, everybody. My uh, <coughs> connection went, and uh, uh, I'm working on that, fixing that. It's raining here, so whenever it rains, I seem to have that problem. Uh, hasn't been raining lately. So do you see any more questions, Julian? Yeah, someone's asking me if I'm going to have butterscotch in the future. Yes, in a um, one-gallon container. Probably in, a, in a, one or two months from now. Fiji okay. Island coconuts. I have two in the ground. I just planted. So let's we'll see how that goes. I'm pretty excited. I heard of there's another coconut that's even more dwarf, the Samoan, the Samoa uh, coconut. <coughs> I want to see if I can get that one. Now, are the coconuts, uh, true, are the coconuts true to seed? Like uh, No, fruit? no. You got to be careful because they can get raped by a regular coconut. And then the tree will, won't be dwarf. So you got to cover it with a plastic grocery, not plastic, a uh, paper grocery bag. When the flower opens, you can, you know, prevent it from getting raped from other pollen from another coconut tree. So when they self-pollinate, you know, that goes, that, that phase goes away. You take out the bag and then all your coconuts will be pure. <coughs> Yellow skin custard apple, how does it taste? Tastes very good. It's very, very good, very nice, mild, not overpowering like other custard apples. It's a very overpowering fruit. Okay, well, uh, I know we have a good amount of people online. Anybody have questions, ask them now. Uh, and uh, ho hopefully I'll get down there soon to make more videos, uh, but if you have questions, uh, you could also post them below the video even after this call, but now's a great time to ask if you have some questions. That's China Chapada um, hybrid taste compared to jackfruit. Uh, almost the same. I have another Champa Jack that I call Banana Crunch. And uh, I, it tastes just like, like jackfruit, very you know, crunchy, sweet, no latex, no bad aftertaste. And what I like about it is very easy peel, just like Champa Deck. You just grab it when it's ripe, just grab it and just peel the skin off. Very easy. Now, uh, what is, uh, a, is there one jackfruit that stands out amongst the, amongst the rest in terms of taste wise and ease to open? And Yeah, jackfruit, um, let me tell you, there's a, there's a lot of bad jackfruits out there, unfortunately. And, you know, which the reason is because they're from seedlings and uh, don't get me wrong. There's some seedlings that can give you good fruit and there's some seedlings that can give you bad fruit. But you never know. But I tend to graft all my jackfruit with select varieties. Um, Golden Nugget is an excellent jackfruit. No latex, crunchy, um, very productive. Uh, another one that I really love is the Cochin. Makes a small jackfruit similar to um, 
golden nugget, uh, lemon gold, very crunchy, excellent tasting jackfruit. J31, another excellent uh, tasting jackfruit. It's not easy peel. You're going to really have to work and get dirty to get into that jackfruit. Cochin, you won't have to get dirty. Golden nugget, you won't have to get dirty. Lemon gold, you might have to get dirty. That's not an easy peel. Um, and there's and I just acquired three new jackfruit varieties that are red flesh inside. Um, apart from the Borneo red, I have Borneo red. That was kind of like orange flesh, but the um, the new ones that I acquired, uh, one of them is called Zane with a Z, with an X. Right inside, I saw my good friend. Uh, Bobby Biswas was uh, eating some fruit out of a Ziploc bag. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? My eyes are about to pop out. You know, don't hold back, man. What's up with this? Tried it. It was excellent. I got the Morning Red also. And I got the Excalibur Red from uh, Excalibur Nursery. So, yeah. What did you think of the Excalibur Red? I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen or tasted. The only one I've seen and tasted was the Zane. I was red, like a choo-choo train. Yeah, like a fire truck inside. Uh, the other ones, I'm not doubting their color, that they're red, but I haven't seen it yet. But I have the trees and I'm just, uh, I'm probably going to, I'm thinking about the top working it on some jackfruits that I have in my collection. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, I love okay. some Borneo red. I think I'm back here. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's a little feedback, but I think I lower your, your volume. Okay, how's that? Uh, okay. Okay. Get this. Your speaker might be too loud, though. Uh, testing. My number one Kaimito variety. Um, uh, I don't think it would be my house variety because it's very thin skin. Very sweet, very little latex, and produces fruit from January, from late December, January, all the way to June, nonstop. All right. Uh, red. All right. That, that red. I'm putting it in the ground. Okay. Uh, so, so tell me again about the lemon, the lemon gold one. Uh, you said it's hard, pretty hard to open. Yeah, there's two kinds of jackfruit. There's the easy peel jackfruit and the hard to get in jackfruit. Those, those are good tasting jackfruits, but they're hard to get in. They're gonna get really messy. The ones that are not messy, um, the easy peels would be a golden nugget, cochin, banana crunch. Um, I think uh, that's it right now. What about the Cochin? What Cochin. About that? Cochin. Cochin. Yeah, that, that's easy peel. No latex. I had some and it just, it was crunchy and it just melted my melted in my mouth at the same time. And it's that's more true. of a dwarf one, right? Yeah. Okay. Trying to redo the chat here. Uh, is it chat Orange work? Crushed jackfruit. I haven't tasted it yet. I, and I have a tree I have to plant in the ground. Been, I, I'm just running out of space. I understand. I understand that. If you know, you're I running love, out of... I love yeah. jackfruit seeds. I eat jackfruit seeds. I boil them with some, with some salt water until they get soft like a potato and just eat them like a snack. Is the... Is the... Jackfruit, uh, you know, in... in, in you know, that you, is it better to plant more trees if you're running out of space or you're eventually going to have to take them out? Is it better not even to try to plant them? Um, if you're running out of space and you want to keep going, I would just 
you know, take put them in containers and just put them in bigger containers as they go. So how what trees do good in containers and what don't? Like, can you grow jackfruits in containers and stuff? What what yeah, tree? I've, I've had fruiting jackfruits in fifteen gallons. And then you, if you have to, you can go up to twenty five, right? Yeah. And then after that, you're gonna to need to get like a forklift. Can you keep pruning them, or you just eventually you're sure. gonna? Sure, not too, not too hard. Don't prune them too hard. Are you eventually gonna run into a problem though? 10, 15 years from now. What trees can you uh, take out of the ground and replant? What are easy trees to do that? Um, mangoes very easy to do. Yeah. And custard apple. Mango and custard apple. Okay. Sapodilla too. Sapodilla is easy to take out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's, there's a thing called root pruning, where it's, which is digging a trench around the, the tree, just to you know cut the root systems, and uh, and then you leave it there and let it heal for like a couple of weeks, and then you finish the job and just pull, you just yank the tree out, and then plant it. Yeah, I uh, I'm sorry, everybody, about the chat. For some reason, when the computer went out here, the when the connection went out, it says the chat's disconnected. No, I'm I'm reading the chat. I, I can read it on your YouTube. Oh, it's still going. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, let me re redo this here. Maybe that'll work. What's the best late season mango that's resistant? That would be E Weiss. Oh, E W A I S. Named after a Egyptian priest, Catholic priest, he planted a mango seed next to his church and made this excellent, beautiful mango. It tastes kind of like florgon to me, but more strong. It has very, very rich sugar flavor in mango. It's just very, very, very sweet. The bricks on that must be off the charts. And I got a, I got a bricks machine, a bricks scooter here. Mm -hmm. On. Anyway, what are my toys? Uh, what fruit? Okay, that's a great question. What trees, uh, fruit trees, do best in the shade or partial shade? Uh, sugar apple, <clears throat> soursop, carambola. Um, the best is a uh, miracle fruit, right? Oh, in the shade? Yeah. 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 Yep. That's and not really a fruit to me, though. Huh? It's, it's not really a fruit to me. It's more like a party favor. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the, another thing you didn't mention, everybody, you didn't mention about Kamito is of all the trees, it's the easiest one, the, the most least maintenance of all the fruit trees. So that's another besides, advantage. Besides Kaimito? No, no. You, Kaimito in general is the easiest tree. Yeah. You didn't mention well, that earlier. Loquat's pretty easy too. Loquat. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Longan, that's pretty easy. You know, I have a BQ that's flowering right now, a BQ Longan, with flowers on it. I have like two trees, two or three trees in, in containers. So they must be really stressed out. <laughs> In all the years you've been doing this, what what tree surprised you the most where it fruited off season? I'm sorry? Of all the years you've been doing this, what tree surprised you the most in actually fruiting a, a off season? Um, off season? Something that's fruiting off season? Well, I like the Rani avocado because it fruited off season. Um, Something else that's off season. Well, right now, these winter uh, months, January, February, uh, you know, we got Canistel, we got Black Sapote, we're starting to get into Kainito. Um, Loquats are starting as well. And uh, Tamarins are starting, Governor's Plum. My governor plum tree, I have a tree that Maurice Kong gave to me a few years back. It's loaded with uh, governor's plum. Well, I mean, by off season, I mean 
like they normally fruit, like you said, your your long long and long and trees fruiting now. So like they normally fruit at one time, but uh, they're fruit. They one year they fruited at a different time. You ever got surprised like that? Uh, well, yeah, with some mangoes, like the the Chocanon mango, that one uh, gave fruit for me in December, and it's known for doing that though. That's why they call it the miracle of mango, right? <laughs> Yeah, it, it doesn't always perform miracles though, every year. So tell us about Abayu or, or uh, Abayu. Abu? Abu, yeah. Oh, I love Abu. The guy who sent me that avocado in the mail from Puerto Rico, he sent me a couple of Abus. And uh, my wife is from Bolivia. And I asked her, have you ever tried this fruit before? She's like, yes, this is a really good fruit. You know, I, I, I've eaten this before. So... Yeah, I love Abby. Do you sell those trees? No, it's hard. It's hard to get Abby seeds. Who's, where can I get Abby seeds? I mean, if I go to Brazil and I say, "All right, I, I want to be the Abby king," give me all the seeds you got. You know, they'll laugh at me. It's like, oh, you can't get that out of here. Yeah, and tell us about Aki. Do you have Aki trees? Yes, I do have Aki. Um, I grafted some Aki. Uh, they're in three gallons. So if anybody wants Aki grafted, I mean, man. Do you have both varieties, the soft and the hard? Um, no, I, I, there's the yellow one is the soft. That's what they call butter Aki. I don't have that one. I have the red one. But the red one, the, this one that I grafted, I eat it raw. It's so soft. It tastes like a sweet cashew. I love Aki raw. You just open yeah. it up, clean oh, out yeah. all that red stuff. You just eat it like a snack. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I, I, the soft ones taste actually better raw. I think the hard ones are pretty amazing. Well, I wait till they ripen up. I mean, I can I, once they open up, you know, there's you know they go through a ripening stage until they turn into mush on the tree still. But by that time, all the beetles and bugs get in there and start eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Can you me, I can, hold on. Someone says I can get you Abu seeds. All right. Send me a, a, a DM. Yeah. I, I might know where you can get some all, you know. Okay. Uh, Brooks late avocado. Yeah, that's a dwarf. That's a dwarf tree and late season. February, March avocado. Brooks late. And I think I have some in 15 gallons. I'm going to be grafting avocados. Uh, well, actually, grafting. Avocados, uh, right now I'm just doing certain varieties. I'm not doing book slate, but I do have some in 15 gallons. Yeah. And uh, somebody told me recently, they said, once you put the tree in the ground, it's best not to move them. I mean, just leave them there, even if it's in a wrong, not the best spot, or you find a better spot. They say it's better to just leave it in the ground. What do you think about that? Um, instead of moving it, yeah, uh, I never move plants. Once, once you're in the ground, that's it. That's like my <laughs> unless, biggest. Unless issue. you have to move it, you know, unless you're moving and you have to take it with you. I don't know. It depends yeah. how old the tree is. Yeah, I'm always moving them and finding people that have them, taking them out, and moving them, and I move from one house to another, and I move the bunch. And uh, but. Uh, so a couple more questions and then we're going to end everybody for tonight, but we'll do this again. Hopefully it says, uh, is it bad uh, if the abu, uh, ab, ab, abu seeds are underdeveloped fruit? Maybe not. Maybe it's still good. It can't be too underdeveloped. The best thing if, you know, if you open up the fruit and the fruit in the seed is black or light brown, then it might be good. So the, the next question is really an important issue. And I speak about this in my videos and, you know, I've learned a lot by meeting a whole bunch of people and, and trade here. And it says a sad problem in the nursery trees are, are mislabeled trees. You buy mango and it's not what you, what they said. And I mean, this happened to me and, you know, I, I've learned over the years, there's only, there's only a few places I'll buy trees from because of this. Uh, so yeah. 
What do you say about that? Yeah, once you mislabel, <clears throat> once you mislabel a tree, the tree is worthless. In my opinion. Yeah. Um, when that happens to me, you know what I do? Like if that happens to me on a mango, I just label it as Lara Special. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's a, it's a Lara Special. I, I promise you it's going to be a good mango, but I don't know what mango it is. Yeah. Another thing is, so I, if I had a mislabeled tree that I put in the ground and I found those mistreat, if I like it, great, but if I don't, you could always graft it if you have to, right? So, but you got to be careful. It's a really important thing and people need to be careful where they're getting their trees from because I know there are some places notorious for mislabeling trees and there are other places that, that's why I like to go to a place where I personally know the people that are labeling them. I see their operation and, and these are the people that I'm interviewing and, and stuff. And uh, because I, it's a really important thing to us, especially if we only have room for a few trees. We don't want to have like one of those trees be a problem. I got I just had that issue with an avocado. I thought I had a Brogdon. I waited six years. The tree's big and coming out now. And it's a uh, winter Mexican, I think, or a seedling. Who knows? But it's, uh, it's a big yeah, issue. It's upsetting because you wait years and years and uh... Yeah. Get something else. So another question is uh can sour stop be grafted onto sugar apple tree? I don't think so. It could then late then years down the road, they'll decide to spit the graft out. It happened to me with uh um Adamoya grafted on custard apple. It grew into a 15 gallon tree and then one day it just spit the graft out. It just detached. Went what about what about uh, what about sugar apple onto soursop? Sugar apple onto soursop? No. Okay. Okay. All right. I think there was some Indian guy on YouTube that had a video, but it just was like the beginning of it, so we don't know what happened in the future with that one. But uh, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, Tom at uh, Sleepy Lizard says. Uh, I drive by half dozen nurseries to get uh, to get to you because the quality of of yours and the way that you treat them. So um, yeah, I attest to that. It's wonderful. Uh, yes. Okay. Another question. Somebody's asking me: Am I still dealing with uh, fruit thieves? Uh, no, I strategically planned it. I have a small place, so I strategically planned. Uh, my trees and I put the less desirable and known ones up front. But what about you on a bigger farm? You have 10 acres. Do you have issues with fruit thieves? Not really. I mean, I have a lot of trees planted outside, other canisters and other stuff planted outside. Um, not really. Not, not in a long time. I do got dogs. I have two nice dogs. There's a guy I interviewed up here that sells mangoes and they twice they got him for fifteen hundred dollars worth of mangoes. Whoa. He got him on video camera and it was a big, big thing. Oh, it was oh, very okay. sad. Well, they got him on camera and they still couldn't find him. The first time they didn't get him on camera and they took everything. And the second time, uh, a couple of days later, they came back. But that time he had a camera. So they put they put a police report out. But it's, it's brutal up here. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, around what size would a grafted Alano Sapodilla be at maturity? Uh, uh, mature enough to make fruit. They, I guess they just said what graft. Yeah, I guess. Um, so. I would think, um, five feet tall, four feet tall. Okay. Uh, do you have warts avocado? No, okay, that's another dwarf. And do you have any self pollinating comitos, or do they need to be pollinated partner tree? Yeah, unfortunately, they don't self pollinate. But if you do have somebody in the neighborhood, so within a mile radius, the birds and the bees can do the rest. So I have a tree, I have a, one house between my house and the other house. And the trees are in each house. Will that be good enough? Yeah. Okay, good, good. But, but it would be better if they were next to each other? 
Sorry? Or not necessarily. Would it be better if they were next to each other or not necessarily? Yeah, yeah I think so. But they can be in the same property far away from each other. And those okay. Are, okay. Uh, the birds and the bees will pollinate it for you. Okay. Uh, all righty. Uh, so let's see. Uh, has anyone ever tried bamboo avocado? I never heard of that. Okay. So, so, okay. So I didn't know that about the, about the Kamito that they had a, they're not self-pollinating. So if somebody just bought one and nobody else in the neighborhood had one, does that mean they're not going to have fruit or is it very unlikely? If it's by itself? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to flower and not make any fruit. Okay. Okay. I yeah. have... I have, uh, I see here. So, do I have honey kiss mango? I have it in a pot. I'm trying to top work it, but it doesn't. I have the worst luck with honey because I try to top work it and the grafts die on me. And yes, I do ship by website, larafarsmiami.com. I ship to California to, you know, all continent to the United States, I guess. Uh huh. Uh... Okay. Why why do you want to top work it? Just because you already have more honey kiss or you don't like it? Or? No, I have to top work uh, what I mean, but what I mean by that I have to graft honey kiss onto a, a tree that I cut. Got you, got you, got you. All right, everybody. We're gonna take let's take uh the last two questions of the night and we'll do this again. Uh and this is uh oh, self-pollinate, yes. Low quad self pollinate. And for those, if those um, who, who don't know this, low quad flower, my God, if you take the time and stop and smell the low quad flower, it smells just like hand lotion from Macy's. It smells just like it. it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, somebody said, are you selling Nila mangoes online soon? Me <laughs> the mango season is right around the corner, but it's not yet. So. Well, the tree I will have I will have Nilam for sale on the as a, as a one gallon tree soon, hopefully. Now the mangoes you have, uh, do you graft them all right? You graft all the mangoes you have. Correct. Okay, and that's a big difference between other farms or nurseries, at least. A lot of them get mangoes from other places, where uh, Julian is doing a grafting himself and labeling them himself. So that's a really good thing. Uh, yeah, we do everything. We do all of our own grafting here in, uh, in my greenhouse. Oh, a really nice greenhouse that uh, the um, it's a 60 by 330 feet long. And uh, 20 out of those 60 uh, is for propagation. And uh, it's really cool to have temperature control and uh, the right shaded. Uh, right shade and the right you know air temperature so i get um perfect environment for for grafting uh, these uh, fruit trees all right uh snails and garden i was in lock hatchery last a couple of days ago but i'll come back out there uh contact me uh via youtube or my website and i'll definitely get in touch with you and come on out there i like gifts and uh and tom i'll see you this weekend and uh, so, every, uh, uh, Julian, give out your contact information for anyone that wants to get trees or, or fruit or whatever you got. Give it, and I'll also yeah. post it below the video uh, when we're done. I'll post his information below as well. Yeah, um, LaraFarmsMiami.com. And if you want to uh, message me, uh, you can just go on Facebook or Instagram and type in Lara Farms, and you can direct message me there. And uh, if you want to give me a phone call, you can just look up, look, look me up on Google, Lara Farms on Google, and, and they'll give you my phone number. Or on Facebook, too. They might have it on Facebook. Now. Great, great. And uh, everybody, I'm going to be uh, doing this again. Uh, I'm going to be doing uh, hold on, this again with uh, uh, hopefully uh, Julian, if we'll come back, but uh, there's other uh, people that I interview and I go on their farms. And if you like this, give this a thumbs up. And if you want to see me interview more people like this, let me know. And uh, I have uh, many of them on here as well and do this. So you could ask your questions. 
uh, now's a great time because it's not summer. So they have some time, but I know some of them are super busy. So uh, Julian, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. And I know everyone learned a lot tonight. Yeah, it was fun. I had a lot of fun, man. Thanks very much. I, have one, I see one more question. I have to better answer it. Do we support you choose smaller than my matrix? No, we grow big in time. I have two that are 20 years old in there. You saw them, Paul. Remember the, the work? Yeah, the oh, yeah. Those oh, are yeah. huge trees. Now, could you keep them small by pruning them? Yeah, of course. Now, if you keep them small, will it, will it, I know you'll get less fruit because they're smaller, but does it eventually, like, someone told me if you take, like, a, a big mango tree, like a Valencia Prada, you try to keep that small, it's, it won't fruit eventually because it'll just... Well, it just cut that one, that one thick branch, you know, that's going straight up and leave all the laterals. And, and, you know, if it has three big branches, cut one. So the other two can continue making fruit. And then two or three years later, cut another one off. And, you know, then the one you cut three years ago will start producing fruit already. Okay. So good plan. Little. Good plan. What do you so think about, what do you think about what Richard Campbell's doing with the, by planting the trees real close together. What do, what do they call it? Intensive gardening or whatever? Um, it's called um, high density. Yeah, high, what do you think about that? I, I think anything he does is fine with me. Anything he does is fine with me. He's cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems to work. He he's, he's has a lot of experience with it. Yeah. So, uh, so, all right, everybody, uh, remember, give this a like and please subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Uh, thank you, uh, Julian, and I'll see you soon. And everybody, uh, you can still post questions after the video is done. And I'll try. And if you have any ideas for new videos, let me know. But I'm going to put more videos up with Julian in the near future. I did a good one with him about Star Apple Camito that we're going to get up soon. And I just recently posted a few with him that are excellent. And he had egg fruit and and avocados and it's so great and uh so thank you thanks again man and uh all right everybody have a blessed night and we'll see you again soon thank you good night stay on one second all right good job man that was great